Thanks for that. Appreciate it. That's what we're going to be speaking about this morning, learning about from God's Word, is how we know those sorts of things are true, that God's Spirit is with us, that God's Spirit is God, that God's Spirit changes us. And so that's what uh, we're looking at as we continue our series on doctrine this morning. We come to Article 6 in the Evangelical Free Church Doctrine of Faith that says this, We believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that He does, glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners. And in Him, they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. So we're going to look more detail at this important statement about who the Holy Spirit is, what He does in our life, and why that matters. The Holy Spirit, to begin with, is God. This is really important for us to understand. Article 1 of the Statement of Faith confirms this. We believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinite, perf- infinitely perfect, and existing eternally in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Most importantly, we have this belief because this is what God's Word affirms to us. And it's important that we believe that the Holy Spirit is God and that we treat Him as God. And so let's look at some of the evidences of this. We see in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, that the Holy Spirit is with God the Father as He is creating. We're also told, of course, that Jesus is Creator. And so you see this often in Scripture that you have God the Father mentioned, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit mentioned as working and moving and doing the very same things together. And so we see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. At creation, we are told the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He was part of this process of creation. Because the Holy Spirit is God, we have evidence that he is present everywhere. In Psalm 139, 7 through 12, King David writes this wonderful meditation upon the fact of the Spirit's omnipresence. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark for you. The night will shine like the day for the darkness is as light to you. Where can I go from your spirit? Just as God the Father is omnipresent, is everywhere, so the Holy Spirit is everywhere also. The Holy Spirit, we are told, inspired God's word. Again, another statement where all three persons of the Trinity of the Godhead are involved. We looked at this in much detail last week, but I remind you of 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We looked at this in much detail last week, but I remind you of this, that all three members members of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit are involved in giving us God's word, God's truth, and he inspired human authors to write. And so again, we see evidence of the Holy Spirit's divinity that he is God himself. You might remember, we just came out of this holiday, but at Christmas, the Holy Spirit was involved in the conception of Jesus. The angel answered Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born in you will be called the Son of God. God. We're reminded of this many times throughout the year, but again, what do we see? God the Father, the Holy Spirit involved in this process of conception of Jesus and assuring us that he is this unique, only begotten Son of God. The Holy Spirit, we're told, worked alongside Jesus, giving him power and ability to accomplish his God's will. Jesus' very ministry was accomplished by the will of God the Father in sending Jesus and the authority of Jesus to accomplish bringing about the reign of God and the beginning to restore the universe to perfection and power of the Holy Spirit. Look, Luke 4, 18 to 19. 
Jesus goes into uh, Nazareth and he takes the great Isaiah scroll and he opens it up and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Again, what does Jesus tell us? That the Holy Spirit is involved in his ministry as much as the Father in sending and Jesus seeking to do the will of God, the Spirit is involved in enabling and empowering what God is doing through Jesus. Most critically, the Holy Spirit is equally part of the Trinity with God the Father and Jesus the eternally begotten Son of God. We see this in the baptismal statement of Matthew 28, 19 where the singular name is used for the three. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we have this affirmation that that they are three in one, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And John speaks about this relationship of the Trinity amongst themselves, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In John 15, 26, when the Counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. This idea of, it does not mean that the Holy Spirit is lesser than God the Father does, but it's God giving us a glimpse in some possible way for us to understand this dynamic of relationship between them. Just as the Son is the eternally begotten Son of God, always and forever that way, the Holy Spirit from eternity past proceeds from the Father and the Son. That is how they relate to one another. It's also important for us to remember that the Holy Spirit is a person, just like Jesus and just like God the Father. And we are to have a relationship with him. Uh, Jesus speaks about this and he says, the teacher will, uh, the Spirit will teach much like him. In John 14, 16, Jesus says the Father will give another counselor. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. It's interesting, he says another counselor. Well, who's he speaking about as the first counselor himself? And just as Jesus came to provide truth and teaching and encouragement and comfort, so the Holy Spirit has come to continue that role of Christ in our lives. And so a few verses later, he says in verse 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And so we see this person, this reality that, that the Holy Spirit teaches, he instructs, he guides, he helps us, much as Jesus did when he walked with his disciples on the earth. Uh, we looked at this verse a while back, this beautiful statement of the Holy Spirit interceding for us as Christians in time of weakness. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. This person role of the Holy Spirit to look at our lives, to look at our weaknesses, to look at our struggles, to look at our challenges, and to go before God the Father, to intercede on our behalf, to pray for, to, to encourage, to help us know Him and love Him and follow Him and receive the grace and the truth and the mercy that we need from God in our lives. There's other texts that speak about the Holy Spirit having emotions in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The context of that verse, the grieving the Spirit, is when we walk in sin, when we don't live as God has called us to, and we're rebelling against Him. It grieves Him. Why? Because He's a person and He knows, much as God the Father and Jesus, that true life is found in us when we're loving Christ, when we're following Him, when we're becoming more like Him. And when we're rebelling against that, when we're refusing that, when we're giving in to sin in our life, it grieves Him to watch us suffer in that instead of living in the light of the truth that God has given us. And so the Holy Spirit is at work with us, in us, just as God the Father and the Son to accomplish their united purposes for our lives. And so since he is God, we must think about him that way and treat him that way, that we, that we worship him, that we can pray to him. And, and as we do that, we remember that we're talking to a person of the Godhead. And so maybe just to bring this home is he's not a power alone. He's not a force that we can command and, and, and get our way with. He, he's not someone that, that replies, responds to what we desire in the sense of he does everything we command him to do. No, we have to humble ourselves before him as he's working with God the Father and the Son, Jesus, to conform us into our lives. And so any teaching or any uh, idea that has him just a sort of this power, this force that we can command for our purposes and will, 
you're abusing the person of God when you do that. He is not that. He is someone that we come to humbly and gratefully and we rejoice in his presence in our life and the fact that he is God who dwells with us. And so we start with God the Holy Spirit being God and understanding that and seeing some evidences of that because now we come into what is he doing in our lives that is so amazing. And I think when we have this picture of who he is as God, what we're going to learn next about him is even more amazing. That God would do these things for us. And the Holy Spirit is God and he works in our lives. And his primary purpose at working in our lives is to help us live in relationship with Christ so that we can know God more fully. We can love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and that we can follow him and serve him and live for him in this world. Our statement of faith speaks about this when it says he convicts the world of its guilt, he regenerates sinners, and in him they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. We're not going to be able to go into all of that, <laughs> but it's going to feel like that by the time we get to the end of it. I will warn you of that. But nonetheless, we're going to unpack this a little bit. Sort of the big picture here of this, this idea that he lives in relationship with us so that we can become more like Jesus. That's the fundamental point of what he's doing in our world, in our lives. And so the Holy Spirit, first, he works in our lives to help us trust in Christ for salvation. And he does that by convicting us of our sin so we will turn to Christ seeing that we need him, right? John says this, and, and Jesus says this in John 16, 8, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, one of his roles will be to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's look at these three words because they're important. The Holy Spirit convicts us in regard to sin sin, meaning that he shows us we are sinners. But what I mean by that is he shows us that, listen, we're living in rebellion to God, that, that we're not wanting to submit and obey him, and, and we behave in ways that are contrary to God's desires for us, right? So, so we lust and we commit adultery instead of express sexual intimacy and committed relationships of marriage. We're greedy and selfish with our money because we think that will bring us happiness and meaning in life instead of fully trusting God with our money and spending it according to his principles. We lie and we cheat and we steal and we slander and we do all of these things. Why? Because we think that'll help us get ahead or cover up our failures or our faults instead of living with integrity. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives as we're doing these things and he shows shows us how this is ripping us apart and ripping others apart and destroying our lives and it brings conviction to us and so we start to see I'm a mess. I'm a sinner. In the fullest sense of that, that I don't know God, I don't want to know God and my life is a disaster because of it. And, and so it moves in our life to help us start to see is there a solution for this mess my life is? He convicts us in regard to sin so that we know, we see, I need someone to save me from the wretched person that I am. I need someone to come in and change my heart and my life and my mind. And I would say that even after we come to faith in Christ, that he still has this role of convicting, of pointing out our, our continual struggles with obedience and, and helping us see our need to turn back to our gracious and forgiving God who loves and cares and wants us to live a life of truth. The Holy Spirit also convicts us in regard to righteousness. And I think what he means here is that he shows us that Jesus is righteous and we are not. When we understand the righteousness of Jesus, we start to believe two important truths. First, we realize that perfect righteousness, perfect moral holiness is what God demands of us. Right? We see that God wants us to sacrificially serve and love others. We see that God wants us to honor our bodies and show perfect respect towards others. And we realize very quickly that we fall very short of that standard and that Jesus has amazingly, absolutely met that standard for us. And so it shows us that, that perfect righteousness is required and we don't got it. And secondly, after we realize that perfect righteousness is required, it helps us to accept that we need to believe in Jesus' righteousness to be saved from our sins. 
What I mean by that is we say, I'm a mess, I'm a sinner. I've been convicted of the reality of my sin. I see the perfect righteousness of God and of Christ, and I realize I need that in my place. I need that to be pardoned, to be justified, to be declared right before God. And we turn to Christ and say, Lord, I am not righteous, but you forgive. And Lord, I am not perfect, but you are. And we start to understand the core of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit convicts us in regard to judgment, meaning that he shows us that Satan is condemned, and if we reject Jesus, we are on the losing side of salvation. This is important because the struggle we have is to think we know best and our way will come to the greatest outcome. And God's word is very clear to say, no, if you live apart from me, you are going to face the worst possible outcome of your sin, the judgment of God, the judgment that will bring upon yourself. And so all three of these things work together to bring us to this place where we realize I need to repent, I need to change, I need to be different, and the only way that can happen is because of what Christ has done for me, that he forgives my sin, that he gives me his righteousness, that he took the judgment of God for me that I might be forgiven, that I might be fully accepted into God's family as his child and, and become one with God, to be united with God as his person and to start to live in his ways and desire to become like him. So that's one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit works, this beautiful work in our life. The first is convicting the world and us as individuals that we need Jesus in our lives, that we might turn and trust that he is the savior who forgives our sins and gives us a relationship with God. And then, this we don't know exactly how this works, but the scripture talks about this and Jesus talks about this, that the Holy Spirit works in our life to help us trust in Christ for salvation by regenerating, by renewing our souls so that it can be in relationship with Christ. John, Jesus is talking with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus and he comes to Jesus and he says this, in John 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not in him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives, flesh, uh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. What is Jesus speaking about here? Well, he's using an analogy, right, that, that, that a radical change happens when a conception takes place, right? A, a change that brings forth new life. And that's a new thing. It's been it's generated, right? There's new life that's born. He's using that illustration to say our salvation is no less a profound, life-changing experiment brought about, experience brought about by God's work in our life. That he says when we must be born again, what he's talking about is the reality of a profound spiritual change that happens for a person who trusts in Christ to live in a relationship with God. It's God's work in our life to regenerate, to change our hearts so that now we're no longer opposed to God but desire to live in relationship with him. Now, Jesus uses this illustration and Nicodemus very clearly is confused by this and, and we've read this many times and we say, oh, how could he be so silly? But if you think about it, if you heard him say this the first time, born again? Jesus, have you gone off your rocker? I know it's late at night. Maybe you need some sleep and we'll interact with this conversation later in the morning but what do you mean born again? How can we possibly be born once more into this world? It's a fair question. It's a confusing statement that Jesus makes, but it's a profound statement because Jesus goes on to say, tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. And in verse six, he's, con he's contrasting these two realities. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. He, I think he's making an allusion here to Ezekiel 36. And I think this is why Jesus is frustrated with Nicodemus later in these conversations that he doesn't understand this. But here's what Ezekiel 36 talks about. How God would radically change human hearts. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will move from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. 
this text is talking about this profound change of regeneration, right? That he's going to give us a new heart, a new spirit. He's going to take this heart of stone, right? The implication there is that it's, it's cold to the things of God. It's not really interested in knowing and following and loving the Lord and his ways. And instead, he's going to turn that. I mean, it's a beautiful image, really, of, uh, of transitioning stone into flesh that's living, that's breathing, that has life within it. And he says, I'm going to put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What Jesus is talking about here is a fundamental change of stance, of relationship, of understanding of who God is. And this change happens at the moment of confession, of, of conversion, if you will, when we look to God and say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be forgiven. I need God's righteousness. Please forgive me. Become the Savior who forgives my sins and gives me a relationship with God. That's evidence even right there of this change from I don't want the things of God to I want the things of God. And it's amazing grace. It's born again grace. And this brings forth a completely new kind of life where our fundamental longing and desire is to live with God as his children. It's also important to see that Jesus says this is the work of God's spirit, thus implying this new life is only possible by God's spirit and God's choice. Look again, he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now someone might ask, how does one know this has happened since the spiritual vent in the spiritual, the, the spirit of a person. And Jesus says, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows whenever, wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. He's saying, look, you can't see this by a physical manifestation, right, of this new birth. It's not like born again Christians are like, have really nice baby skin all of a sudden, right? Oh, that guy must have been born again. He looks like a newborn baby. He's all pudgy and soft and no more wrinkles. No, that's not what he's talking about, right? He's talking about the reality that, that as the wind moves, right, his analogy here is that we can't see the wind. We know it's there by the effects of what it's doing, right? Later in this week, and maybe even this morning, when you step outside and you feel Arctic blasts of minus something, you'll know it's there. You probably won't see it unless there's some snow blowing in it. <laughs> but you'll know it's there. You'll feel its power. You'll see its effect as it freezes the world around us. And so Jesus is saying the same thing. That the Spirit's work in us gives us a new life. We cannot see the Holy Spirit. It's not going to change our physical appearance, but it's going to change how do we think, what do we believe, how are we acting? What do we long for now? When we do stumble in sin and give into it, is there conviction that, hey, this isn't right, or is it like, hey, whatever, it doesn't really matter anymore? Or maybe we even live that way for a little while, but as once the conviction comes, we start to say, I can't do that anymore. Is there evidence of God's spirit within us, of this change that has happened, this newborn life that God has created within us? And it's really a fascinating and amazing truth that the Holy Spirit comes and he changes our position to, to God and he does that through conversion and he does that by when, when he convicts us of our sin and our need for Christ, all of a sudden our eyes, our spiritual eyes are opened, our hearts are changed to say, I want to know God. I want to follow God. I want to live with God. And we're told as well that the Holy Spirit works in our lives to help us then live in relationship with God. It's not just getting us into relationship, but it's continuing to sustain that relationship. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, Jesus tells the disciples that they'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This idea of baptized is a statement of unity, of union, right? When, when people were baptized by John's baptism, it was a statement of we believe what John is teaching. We believe what John has said we need to do. The same is true with the Holy Spirit is that we now are united together with God because of this work of the Spirit. And Paul talks about this in Galatians, that we are baptized by the Holy Spirit and joined with Christ. He says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. Look what he says. You are sons of God through faith in Christ. Faith saves us, brings us into relationship with God. The baptism into Christ have clothed yourselves 
yourself with Christ is now union, is unity, relationship with Christ. And salvation opens it up that anyone from any race or creed or place of social status can be brought into relationship with God. And then we have even more assurance, these beautiful assurances here that we are adopted children of God, right? Galatians 4, 6 through 7, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you're no longer a slave but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you also an heir, right? These words of assurance that you are God's child, you are adopted, that you are in Christ. This statement of in Christ shows up many, 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 many times in the New Testament. And it's to assure us that when you trust in Jesus for salvation, when you believe in him, when you've been born again, you're in Christ, you're adopted by Christ. And it goes even beyond that. Then he talks about this idea of indwelling of God with us. And the Holy Spirit works to help us know and love and follow by indwelling us, right? Look at what he says. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come. And he was promised, why, to verify that we're God's children and then to guide us in our lives, to empower us for service through spiritual gifts and to help us love and know Jesus in all his ways. He says in John 14, 6, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Again, Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, right? That, that the Holy Spirit has promised to come into our lives to speak truth to us, to help us understand God's word, to apply it to our lives, whether that's conviction or spiritual gifts that are gonna change us, that we're gonna live out in relationship with the church and others in our community. The Holy Spirit empowers powers and guides to share the gospel as we saw in Acts 1.8. And the Holy Spirit gives us these spiritual gifts, these different abilities and skills to serve each other as Christians. In 2 Corinthians 12.4, there are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good, right? That, that he's called us to be in relationship with God. He's made that possible. The Holy Spirit shows us our need for God. He convicts us of our sin. He indwells us that we might be able to actually live in relationship and know him more and follow him more in this life. It's an amazing truth that God the Holy Spirit dwells in you and he dwells in us as the church, as the temple of the place where God's Spirit dwells now. So think about this. The same Holy Spirit that created the universe in all of its majesty and wonder indwells you and gives you new spiritual life. Heart of stone to heart of flesh. Opposed to God, enemies of God to children of God. The same Holy Spirit who is everywhere present and all-knowing, who communicates through his word and able to inspire men to write the very words of God, he indwells you to guide you and direct you to follow that very word he gave. What an amazing gift. And this same Holy Spirit who conceived Jesus Christ, the God-man, this Holy Spirit who did miraculous things through Jesus' ministry, he indwells you to give you gifts of ministry that you might be a blessing to other Christians and share the gospel and help people in this world. And so what all of this ultimately means for us too and this great hope is that we're safe in Christ. We're sealed for salvation in heaven one day. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Look how this is based upon gospel belief, trusting in Christ. In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. In verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. When you trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you and he seals you that you're in this relationship with God, you will not leave it. You are moved and encouraged and enabled and convicted and helped along the way to grow and mature and become what Christ has called us to. And ultimately in heaven, we're perfect, we're made righteous forever, we dwell with God forever in that perfect place. We celebrate this, we rejoice in this. This is the fundamental thing we see this morning is that the Holy Spirit is God and he works in our lives to help us live in relationship with Christ 
so that we can know him, we can know our Heavenly Father, we can know this Holy Spirit more, and that knowledge will move our hearts to love and obedience and following him and all that he's called us to do, and that we might be a blessing to others in our lives as well. The other truth this shows us profoundly, and we talked about this a lot at Christmas, but we're not alone. This is the evidence of that reality. You are not alone. God dwells with your life in his spirit. He's with us to affirm God's love for us, to assure us we're God's children, to convict us of sin so we can grow in our faith, to help us know how to live and empower us to live faithfully as God's children. What an amazing gift that God has given us in his spirit. We rejoice in that, we celebrate in that, we're grateful for it. And as we turn to communion, I was reminded of Titus 3, 4 through 7, this great text that shows us how Jesus and the Holy Spirit give us eternal life. He says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. I love that. It's God's kindness. It's his love that motivated him to do this, having saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, right? What does the Holy Spirit convict us of? The righteousness that we don't have and the righteousness that Christ has. But because of his mercy, he had mercy upon us who were lost and needed his forgiveness and grace. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Right, this idea of regeneration, renewal that comes, the heart of stone into the heart of flesh that we're washed, we're made new, we're renewed. Jesus pours them out. Remember he says, I go and I send that his work might be done. What a great thing. And then he says, so that having been justified by his grace, right, we're declared right by God's grace in Christ, that he forgives, he gives us his righteousness. We're completely forgiven and accepted by God because of who Christ is, that we might become heirs, adopted children of God having the hope, the assurity of eternal life now and forever with God. We praise God for his kindness and his mercy that saves us by Jesus' death and resurrection to forgive our sins. We praise God for his kindness to save us by washing away our sins and giving us regeneration, new birth into spiritual life through the Holy Spirit's work in us. And we ask God as we come to communion as well to help us live well as his heirs, as people of his kingdom. We ask the Holy Spirit to teach us God's ways, right? We all need to keep learning that. We ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin so that we can turn from it, that we can leave it behind and we can become more like Christ and live in the freedom of righteousness and holiness in our lives. We ask the Holy Spirit to guide us into the fullness of life that we can have with God as we await his return. Say, Lord, we know that the holy eternal life is to know God the Father and the Son he sent. And we can do that through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And we look forward to that day when he comes and we're made perfect and righteous to live with him forever. We invite the ushers to come forward. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we are grateful for you and your gift to us of eternal life through your death and resurrection. Lord, we're grateful that you and our Father sent the Holy Spirit into our lives, into our world. Lord, we're grateful for his work of conviction that brought us all who've trusted in Christ to the point where we knew we needed God. We needed his mercy and grace. Lord, we're grateful for the reality that through the Holy Spirit we are born again, we are renewed, we are regenerated, we become your children, heirs. We're thankful, Lord, that you are God of mercy and grace and kindness who continues to work in our lives to help us become more like you through the Holy Spirit who indwells us. So Lord, we come first thanking and praising you for this amazing truth and this gift of life you've given us through the Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to search our hearts and our minds as we prepare for communion, even as we leave this place. Would you assure us of your love and of the Father's love for us as your children? Would you guide us in the areas we need guidance? Would we experience your comfort and peace? Would you convict us of sin and truly change our heart's desires that we might obey and love the Lord and follow him? Would you show us how to be kind to our friends and neighbors? Would you show us the gifts that you've given us to bless our fellow Christians as we all walk towards becoming more like you? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do your good work in us. That as the song said, it does change the way we see and what we seek. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that. That we would see your truth more clearly and we would seek your will more faithfully in our lives. 
pray these things in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.